Coming up in today's newscast, Labor Party leader Avi Gabay dissolves the opposition's Zionist Union. Palestinian American citizen Isam Akel is sentenced by the PA to life in prison with hard labor, and the inauguration date for the new Ramon International Airport is officially set. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that he would not resign from office should the Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit accept police recommendations to indict him before elections. And speaking to a press conference in Brazil, where he's currently visiting, Netanyahu addressed all the issues surrounding the upcoming Israeli elections. But again, when asked at the press conference if he would resign in the face of indictments, he responded with, no way. <laughs> אמרתי לכם את זה כל הזמן, לא שיניתי את עמדתי. שנית, ישראל היא מדינת חוק, ולפי החוק, ראש הממשלה לא צריך להתפטר בתהליך של שימוע. שלישית, השימוע הרי לא מסתיים עד שלא שומעים את הצד שלי. ולכן לא הגיוני לפתוח בתהליך של שימוע לפני הבחירות, אם אתה לא יכול לסיים אותו עד הבחירות. אני מבקש מכם לתאר לעצמכם מה קורה אם מדיחים ראש ממשלה, לפני סיום שימוע, ואחר כך בסיום השימוע מחליטים לסגור את התיק. זה אבסורד, זו פגיעה איומה בדמוקרטיה. The Prime Minister also publicly criticized Naftali Bennett and Ayelet Shaked's move to split from their right-wing Jewish home party and form a new party, Hayamina Chadash, or the New Right. Netanyahu said that there is a danger that this will destroy the right bloc into splinter parties that will not pass the electoral threshold. He said that he would, quote, check all options, end quote, regarding uniting the right, and he said that he would do what he can to prevent it adding that, quote, I will act responsibly so that the right-wing bloc retains its strength and will not act irresponsibly in a move that could harm it, end quote. He added that no one knows what they, Bennett and Shaked, will do with the mandates that they receive, stating that they could easily pass on mandates to the left and support Yeshatid party leader Yair Lapid instead. Regarding the United States peace plan, Netanyahu then said that the United States is unlikely to release its long-awaited peace plan anyway during elections because it wants to maximize, not minimize, its chances of success. Netanyahu also said that he was opening up Israel to the world as prime minister and said that, quote, we are connecting the world to China, India, and to the Western world. And he mentioned that he doesn't see any other political candidate able to match his diplomatic abilities. In yet another shocking surprise this election season, Labor Party leader Avi Gabay announced on Tuesday that he was ending his partnership with Hatnua leader uh, Tsipi Livni, effectively dismantling the Zionist Union faction. The Zionist Union was established ahead of the 2015 elections by Livni and then Labor Party leader Isaac Herzog. And after Gabay replaced Herzog as leader of the party, he honored previous arrangements allowing Livni to become the leader of the opposition in the Knesset. But at a press conference this morning, Gabay spoke at a podium with an expressionless Livni sitting beside him, saying that it's not easy to enter into a partnership that someone else made, but that he had been committed to, quote, doing what was right to win the elections. That being said, Gabay continued that it was obvious the two parties were struggling to see eye to eye, and he said that, quote, the public is smart and also sees that the relationship is not working. He said, quote, I still believe in partnership and in uniting a large camp to bring about change, but successful partnerships require friendships, keeping agreements and loyalty. Unfortunately, this is not happening in this partnership, end quote. He then wished Livni, who was clearly taken by surprise by the announcement, success in the elections. Livni, on the other hand, would not comment at the time. Later, she tweeted, quote, It's good that the doubts have been dispelled so that we can focus on the important national challenge ahead of us. To all those who truly believe in our path, there will be a revolution in the coming elections, end quote. And now joining us with more on the ongoing upsets and announced party rearrangements ahead of the elections in the new year is Benjamin Lashkar, a Likud candidate in the upcoming primary elections. Benjamin, thank you so much for coming back into the studio today. Hi, thank you for inviting me. All right, so let's talk about the Zionist Union a bit, uh, or the lack thereof at this point. Yes. Does the split with the Zionist Union, how, does it, how is that going to affect the opposition, the left, uh, in the upcoming elections, do you think? Well, the, the left is in a big uh, trouble. There are so many parties running, so many uh, new messiahs. I mean, there is uh, the old messiah, uh, Lapid, now there is Gantz. We, nobody knows what he thinks. Nobody <laughs> knows what he wants to do. He doesn't speak. Uh, now we have Tsipi Livni, who is running alone. Maybe she's going to, to run with uh, Ehud Barak. Uh, it's very difficult to know what's going to, to happen uh, on the left. I, they're in a very bad uh, situation. Do you see that the split with the left 
do you think that that will have an effect on mandates? Like how many, how many of the different left parties will actually even get mandates in the Knesset? Uh, in the upcoming elections in April? It's impossible to say, but uh, the, the Labour Party is, is now in a difficult situation. I mean, they, they, in the last uh, poll, they, they, they were down to eight seats. It's never happened. Maybe now there will be even less. And the threshold is four mandates. We have Meret, who is also very close to the threshold. CP Livni doesn't pass the threshold. I don't know. It's a very dangerous situation for them. And of course, I'm very happy. Well, so, okay, this is also kind of reminiscent, yes. you know, it's a very mirror image, really, with the Israeli right right now, because with... Exactly. It, well, right, I mean, between, between uh, you know, all the splits with the different factions on the right, with Ayamina Khadash and, uh, and, you know, Kulanu, people are moving around between the Likud and, and other parties. Are we seeing, are we going to see the same effect, really, on, on the right, then? Uh, I, I, won't, I will not call Kulano a right-wing party. For, for me, it's a left-wing party, but uh, it's another issue. Um, we are going to see. I know that the uh, Jewish Home Party is uh, now engaged in uh, talks with uh, other very uh, far-right parties, and like uh, Otzma de Israel or uh, Eli Shai, and maybe they will uh, go together, and together they can pass the threshold. I don't know what will happen to uh, Lieberman. It's very, very close. It's a problem. Shas, it's also a problem. I mean, they're very close. Um, maybe they will go with the other ultra-orthodox parties. Uh, in the end, I think we are going to see um, uh, unions of parties, or there is another possibility, one I support, is to uh, uh, lower the threshold back to 2%. I mean, that's what the Likud uh, wants to do. I think it's more democratic. I think it was a mistake to uh, increase the threshold. Uh, when was the threshold increased to 4? Uh, it, 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 no, it has been increased to 3.25%, so oh, okay. 4 mandates. Uh, in the last election, it was increased in 2015. Okay. Uh, so recently, so it's, we, okay. It's very recent, and uh, the, the effect has been to uh, create uh, average parties, and with average parties, you, you, in fact, it's, it's increasing the, the power of uh, average parties, mm. and uh, it's very bad for democracy. I see. All right, so if we, if we lower the mandate, do you see more factions uh, kind of uniting, or maybe few, because if, if they don't need to unite, you know, say the Zionist Union, it just dissolved. It would, would another union or an opposition or even in the right, would that, would you need a union like that if the mandate uh, threshold were lower? It's, it's a technical issue on some level, but remember that in the past, for example, in 81, in 81 the threshold was 1% and the Likud got 48 mandates and the Labour got 47 mandates. 80% of the population voted for the two big parties. I mean, it's not the threshold, it's what we propose. If we want the people to vote for the Likud, to vote for Avoda, the Labour, we, we need to propose something very clear. We need to, to have a very clear policy and we need to give them hope. And, uh, uh, and that's what we need to do. The, the technical issue is much less important. All right, Benjamin, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. All right, now back to South America. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is set to meet with United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Brazil today to discuss the withdrawal of United States troops from Syria and other regional security issues. And the meeting is also a precursor to Netanyahu's planned meeting with National Security Advisor John Bolton, who will be traveling to Israel and Turkey later this month, again to discuss the withdrawal. Meanwhile, the New York Times reported Monday night that according to anonymous administration officials, United States President Donald Trump has agreed to extend the withdrawal time to four months, as opposed to his previously promised 30 days. This report was then echoed by remarks made by Republican Senator Lindsey Graham following a meeting with Trump on Sunday. I share his goal to withdraw our forces from Syria. I just want to do it in a smart way, make sure that Iran's not the big winner. And uh, after the discussions with the president and General Dumford, I've never felt better about where we're headed. I think we're slowing things down in a smart way, but the goal has always been the same, to be able to leave Syria, make sure ISIS never comes back, our partners are taken care of, and Iran's contained, and I think that's possible. It's gonna take a little longer than everybody thought, but hopefully we can get there. Today also marks the first day of Patrick Shanahan's new role as United States Defense Secretary. He's replacing James Mattis, effective January 1st, who resigned amid disagreements with Trump over the withdrawal of United States troops from Syria. Mattis had offered to stay in his role until February 28th to oversee the withdrawal and a smooth transition of his position, but Trump hastened his departure and appointed Shanahan in his place. In his farewell written message to Pentagon employees, Mattis said Monday that the department is, quote, proven to be at its best when the times are most difficult, end quote, adding, keep the faith in our country and hold fast, alongside our allies, aligned against our foes.
In other security-related news, despite weeks of publicized successes along the northern Israeli border with Lebanon, IDF Intelligence Chief Major General Tamir Heyman confirmed to a conference on Monday one of Israel's biggest fears. That simply put, Operation Northern Shield may never uncover all of Hezbollah's cross-border terror tunnels. But while speaking to the Kalkalist conference hosted in Tel Aviv, Heyman reminded the crowd that Operation Northern Shield was never solely intent on destroying tunnels anyway. Rather, it was to thwart Hezbollah's primary attack plan, namely, quote, to conquer villages on the northern border and to penetrate the area near the border, end quote. For added comparison, Heyman pointed out that Hamas in 2014 had already built well over 30 known tunnels into Israel, as opposed to the five Hezbollah tunnels discovered and destroyed thus far. Yet that didn't stop us from blunting that threat either. So essentially, the primary goal of deterring a larger attack from Hezbollah is accomplished by limiting, limited action and the preceding threat of the IDF's ability, rather than via a fully fleshed out search and destroy mission. With that said, though, the broader actions in Operation Northern Shield, apart from tunnel detection and destruction, have not yet been specified. Israel, as well as the United States, have now officially quit the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Agency, or UNESCO, today. And with us to discuss this, as well as other additional developments at the UN, is ILTV's Lidar Gavelazi. Thanks for joining us, Lidar. Thanks, Aaron. So Israel and the U.S. officially quit UNESCO as of the stroke of midnight last night. This is something that's been coming for a long time. The U.S. announced its intention to quit at the end of the year back in October 2017, uh, with Israel shortly following suit. All right, so can you expand a little bit on, on why the United States and Israel decided to quit the agency, though? Well, UNESCO has consistently passed resolutions that both Israel and the U.S. have decried as anti-Semitic and biased against Israel. Uh, just to name a few, the organization passed resolutions declaring Jewish holy sites in Judea and Samaria like the Tomb of the Patriarchs and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem as solely Palestinian or Muslim in significance. Just this past summer, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that since 2009, UNESCO has passed 71 resolutions condemning Israel with nowhere near this amount with all other countries uh, combined. I think, uh, I think it was less than 10, the, the number he gave. Uh, okay, so what impact will this move have on UNESCO? Well, at this point, I think it will have very little effect. The U.S. and Israel essentially both stopped paying their dues to the organization in 2011 after it recognized Palestine as a state. Uh, Israel owes the organization anywhere between an estimated 8 and $10 million, and the U.S. debt has reached more than $600 million. Uh, and the two countries already lost their voting rights in 2013 over failure to pay their dues. So the move now is more of a following through statement and more procedural in nature. And is it the right decision for Israel to, you know, to simply quit the organization and not have its voice heard or to represent its concerns uh, or opposition? Uh, well, look, Israel is, is totally outnumbered at UNESCO, and so any anti-Israel resolution will most likely automatically pass. Israel's impact or its ability to do anything was limited, if not non-existent. So the question is if it should still hold a seat, if only to voice its, its objections. Uh, some critics have said, yes, they should, but others have said, what's the point? You know, why sit at the table when you're constantly being insulted? Uh, especially when your greatest ally, uh, the United States, also announced that it's leaving. I guess we'll see pretty soon, though, you know, who's right. Until then, Lidar Gavelazi, thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. While the world ushered in the New Year Monday evening with fireworks, sparklers, and celebrations, the IDF was operating as usual, preventing attempted terror attacks. Two Palestinian suspects in the West Bank village of Yatta were arrested in evening raids by the IDF and Israeli police and were taken in for questioning. M16 rifles and ammunition was found in their possession as well and was seized. Earlier Monday morning, in other arrest raids, six members of the family of the Ofra shooter were also arrested. Saleh Omar Barghouti, who was killed earlier in December in a shootout with the IDF, committed a drive-by shooting attack at an Ofra bus stop, injuring seven, including a pregnant woman who lost her baby that was delivered prematurely due to the attack. Meanwhile, as the IDF and Israeli police were active in the field, Israeli courts sentenced two Palestinian attackers to prison. 57-year-old Jamil Tamimi, who stabbed to death 20-year-old British exchange student Hannah Bledon on a Jerusalem train in 2017, was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Typically, he would have been given a life sentence, but the charges were slightly reduced with prosecutors explaining that, quote, this was not a terrorist incident, but a terrible murder carried out by a mentally ill person, end quote. As for 26-year-old Madat Abu Sanima, he joined the Hamas terror organization over a decade ago and has launched rockets and explosive attacks against Israel, and he's also conspired to commit murder and other offenses. While the Be'er Sheva court sentenced Sanima to 20 years in prison after he confessed to his offenses, 
And despite these latest incidents, however, the IDF also released in its summary of 2018 a conclusion that overall, Palestinian terror attacks from the West Bank have dropped in number for the fourth consecutive year, from 97, quote, terror events in 2017 to 87 in 2018. It was 169 in 2016. Attacks from Gaza, on the other hand, increased over last year, with over a thousand rockets alone being fired. Meanwhile, as the Israeli courts sentenced Palestinian attackers, a Rishon LeZion magistrate's court yesterday ruled to extend the detention of three Jewish minors who were arrested on Sunday on suspicion of involvement in a terrorism case. A gag order was issued pre uh, preventing the publication of any other details relating to the investigation, however, which is being led by the Shin Beit Security Service and the Israeli police in Judea and Samaria. What we do know is that on Sunday, a squadron of Shin Beit agents and police officers raided a yeshiva in northern Judea and Samaria, arresting at least two of the youths in question. The third was later arrested at a different location, and now the Shin Beit is currently interrogating the three minors while blocking access to their lawyers, which the Shin Beit was actually given the right to do in this alleged case of Jewish terrorism. Right-wing activist Itamar ben Gvir, one of the minors' lawyers, heavily criticized the conduct of Israeli authorities, however, in the handling of the investigation and interrogation of the teens. This in reference to the Shin Beit's previously disclosed methods in 2015 as well, when defendants claimed to have been tortured in interrogation surrounding the arson murder of three members of the Duwabsha family in the Palestinian village of Duma. Meanwhile, outside the Rishon LeZion court, a fight actually broke out between right-wing supporters of the three minors and police. And one of the parents of the three minors, whose names are also under gag order, then also expressed his concern for the youth's well-being in an interview with Israel's Channel 2 News on Monday night, where his face and voice were blurred. In other news, the Palestinian Authority's Higher Offenses Court on Monday issued a lifelong prison sentence with hard labor against Palestinian-American citizen Isam Akel for attempting to sell land to Jewish Israelis in Jerusalem. According to the Ramallah court, Akel, who also has an Israeli ID and resides in East Jerusalem, was convicted of, quote, attempting to sever parts of Palestinian land and annex it to a foreign state, end quote. Akel and his family both deny the allegations, and he'll have a chance to appeal the ruling, but the Palestinian Authority takes a very harsh position against any Palestinians who sell land without permission to a, quote, hostile state or any of its citizens, end quote. And in the eyes of the PA, such land includes East Jerusalem. Due to Akel's dual citizenship, though, the United States has also gotten involved, demanding his release. United States Ambassador to Israel David Friedman even explained back in November how the suspected crime violated American values. The PA so far hasn't budged, though. According to Israeli officials, Akel was arrested in Ramallah in October for selling the land and doing so without permission from the PA authorities or his business partners in the West Bank. This led to over 30 Palestinian Authority officials being arrested by Israel on the grounds of operating illegally in Israeli territory, however, and detainees even included the PA's appointed governor of East Jerusalem, Adnan Reit, who's been arrested multiple times since then. Further, according to the Khan Israel public broadcaster, an anonymous PA official added that Israel has reportedly halted all security cooperation with the PA in the West Bank areas near Jerusalem over the last few weeks, reportedly also in connection to Akhil's detention. Well now, after his harsh sentencing, Israel and the United States' reaction both still remains to be seen. In one of the final acts of the Knesset in 2018, the Israeli parliament on Monday passed a new bill that makes soliciting prostitution and paying for it illegal. At the same time, the legislation establishes a plan to rehabilitate sex workers, which is set to be approved soon as well. In order to enforce the new law, the bill also dictates that anyone even found in a location mainly used for prostitution is subject to arrest on suspicion of intending to engage in the act. First offenders will be charged with an administrative offense and fined around 2,000 shekels. Repeat offenses, however, if within three years of the first arrest, would result in another minimum fine of 4,000 and up to over 75,000 shekels. The bill was drafted through the collaborative efforts of Justice Minister Ayelet Sheked, Knesset member Shuli Mualem of the new Hayamina Khadash party, and Knesset member Aliza Lavi from Yeshatid, who also heads the Knesset subcommittee on the fight against prostitution and the trafficking of women. And after the vote, Lavi said that this was an emotional moment that will help define the state of Israel. She said, quote, The law rights a wrong that has been going on for too many years, and it'll help reduce the demand for prostitution that is the driving force behind this industry, through rehabilitation and reintegration into society of women and girls trapped in prostitution, end quote. Similarly, Zionist Union MK Shelly Yechimovich also lauded the passage of the law as an historic step, saying that the war on prostitution resembles the struggle for the emancipation of slaves. In some interesting news, a new genetic study found that almost a quarter of all Latin Americans could have Jewish ancestry. According to the study that was published in the Nature Communications magazine, 23% of the people in the sample showed genes connected with Sephardic and Mediterranean ancestry. And ILTV's Joy Gavijon is here to tell us more. 
Thanks, Aaron. This is very interesting. So for the study, more than 6,500 individuals originally from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico and Peru were analyzed and their DNA was compared with genetic data taken from more than 2,300 individuals from reference populations that represent five major regions in the world. Native Americans, Europeans, East and South Mediterraneans, Sub-Saharan Afri uh, Africans, sorry, and East Asians. All right, yeah, yeah, okay, so, but the article in Nature Communications magazine is titled Latin Americans Show Widespread Converso Ancestry and Imprint of Local Native Ancestry on Physical Appearance. Exactly, that's referring to the results. According to the study, almost a quarter of the Latin Americans in the sample share 5% of their heritage or more with people that live in North Africa and East and South of the Mediterranean, including Sephardic Jews. But overall, the Converso genes make only a small part of the ancestries of the populations that were studied from each of the countries. Okay, and then just to make it clear, what exactly are you calling the Converso genes? Right, well, Converso is the word that we use in Spanish to refer to the people that during the Inquisition uh, in Spain and Portugal were forced to convert from Judaism to Christianity. I see. All right, so now how accurate is the study? Well, according to the geneticist Chacon Duque, the study doesn't represent the whole population and has biases. And that's because the sample didn't reach the 7,000 people, so we can't say for sure that a quarter of Latin America's Americans actually have Sephardic genes, but it, it shows a... You know, shows a pretty big correlation anyway. Not, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, so this is very interesting because, you know, just this month, uh, Latin United States Representative-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said that uh, she has Sephardic origins right. uh, and that her ancestors escaped the Inquisition fleeing to Puerto Rico. Exactly. And now, according to this study, there are apparently many more like her. So. That's amazing. All right. Well, Joy, thank you for the update. I can't wait to see how many more people uh, might be relatives. Of course. Thank you, Aaron. All right, now Transportation Minister Israel Katz announced this week that the new Ramon International Airport will be inaugurated later this month on January 22nd and named for fallen Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon and his son, fallen Israeli pilot Asaf Ramon. The $500 million airport in the Negev will begin at first by only taking in domestic flights. Then operations gradually will grow to include international airlines at a later time. The official inauguration ceremony is set to take place in the presence of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Israel is hoping that the new airport will boost tourism to the Red Sea resort town of Eilat, hopefully attracting a million foreign visitors annually by the year 2025. Currently, foreign tourists are scarce in the winter months, when the temperatures in Eilat are warm and hotels operate at half capacity. And this despite two airports already servicing Eilat. One is the old airport in the city center, which is mainly for domestic flights, as it can't accommodate any larger aircrafts and it's already filled to capacity with some 1.4 million domestic travelers. Therefore, international flights are currently mostly only available to Eilat via the Ovda military airport, which is a grueling 60 kilometers or 40 miles away from the city. The new Ramon airport, however, will have a capacity of 2.5 million passengers with room to expand, and it's situated just 18 kilometers from the city. Finally, the new airport is the first to be built in Israel since the establishment of the state, and it'll serve Israel as an additional international airport, as well as an alternative to Ben Gurion International Airport near Tel Aviv in the event of an emergency. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, with the dissolving and re-establishing of political parties left and right, today's word is lefazer, meaning to scatter or to dissolve. Now, elections were first called when Prime Minister Netanyahu fizer or dissolved his coalition, and since, since then, multiple parties and politicians have become mefuzar or scattered to the wind, including, of course, Avi Gabay's announcement today to dissolve or lefazer the Zionist Union. Well, as they say, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, so hopefully all this pizur or scattering will end with something great and not a runny mess. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy and cool with a low of around 52 or 11 degrees Celsius, and then tomorrow you can expect more partly cloudy skies and a chance of light afternoon showers, but a slight rise in temperatures, too, to a high of about 65 or 18 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.74 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.